1 Peter, uh, and we are coming this morning to chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, I'm about to despair of making it through 1 Peter by Christmas. I just am finding it's too rich, you know? Now, I don't want to do six years like I did with Romans. You know, you know that story, don't you? Way back, I taught the book of Romans. It took six years. That's too long. I had about four different classes. They just kept cycling in and out. Enough of this guy, you know, and somebody else would come so for So it's not going to be that. It won't go much past Christmas, but I had thought I could finish First Peter by Christmas, and I, I'm beginning to doubt that. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. It will speed up as we go along. But anyway... Uh, for what it's worth, we are uh, moving, First Peter uh, chapter 1 is kind of a, you would say, a sort of overture in which he's getting certain themes before us that will recur as we go along, and so each of the things he introduces here is so significant, we can't rush through them too much, even though they will pop up again in uh, subsequent discussions. But so far, we've got the first two verses, which give us a doctrine of the Trinity and the role that each person in the Trinity plays in connection with our salvation. So the Father foreknows us, predestines, the Son pays the price to get rid of the guilt that would keep us out because God can't tolerate in his holy presence, guilty, vile creatures such as we would be otherwise. So Christ wipes that out, paying the price. The Holy Spirit comes and applies that work to us, changing our hearts. So all three persons in the Trinity actively involved in our redemption, making us, if I can dare to put it this way, like family members of the Trinity through Christ, God our Father, Christ our brother, and so on. So that's the first two verses. Then the next Uh, several verses, we started this last week, we didn't quite finish it, but we will today, Uh, has to do with how that applies to us. So if you can imagine the grace of God flowing out of heaven from the triune God and it hits you, and the effect of that light of grace hitting you is a regenerative thing. It brings you alive. It gives you what Jesus calls new birth. It opens your eyes. Once I was blind, now I see. It becomes this transforming moment which turns our lives into kind of a B.C. and A.D. You know what I mean? We change, and we can think, I'm a different person today than I once was. And what happened? Some kind of transforming event. That's called the call. It is applied to us by the Holy Spirit, but it comes through the proclamation of the gospel. And so virtually anybody that comes to faith is going to come through hearing some form of the gospel. It may be a broken form. God can use very broken vessels, you know. Sometimes it's a very imperfect kind of uh, message, and yet still God can infuse it with grace, and there's a transforming moment. Now, the third element that we're going to get to today as well is, okay, what do we do about it, you see? So we have the beginning of this thing in in God. We have the impact on us in regeneration, and now we have the question, okay, where do we go from here? And this becomes the rest of the book. Appreciated John introducing an idea of kingdom ethic. In some ways, that's what we're doing. We're saying, okay, what do we do? What's the change in my life, and how do I, in a practical way, implement this, this in my life so that, in fact, I start marching to this new drummer? And that's what Peter wants to give us, and he introduces us to it with what I'm going to call the call to holiness. That's the word he uses. Uh, This is a word which provokes all kinds of interesting reactions to people. When you say to them, okay, now we need to live a holy life, there's all sorts of caricatures that can pop into our minds, you know, as a result of that. So save your judgment as to what exactly that means. But that's the term Peter uses, and so I don't want to stray away from his language. I want to use it and take it seriously and try to ask the question, so what's the significance of that call to holiness? So we're going to look at verses 10 through 16. The first three of these verses, three or four, 
is really wrapping up what we talked about last week, and the last few verses is taking up then the new focus, which is, okay, where do we go from here? What do we do? So that's the idea. Now, just to get us going, I'm going to recall with you what we saw last week in which Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with a glorious and inexpressible joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then he continues. So this is now beginning at verse 10, the word of God. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke the word of, the word of God searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he spoke of the suffering of Christ and the glory that would follow. It was revealed to them that he, they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who preached the gospel to you through the Holy Spirit who was sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Then he continues... Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given us when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the passions you once had, but as he who called you is holy, be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Kind of my rough paraphrase of what's there, but that's the idea. So you can see the little transition. We wrap up what we saw last time and kind of get going to this new call, which is a call to holiness. So we'll try to take a little bit of a look at that as well. All right, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going. Our Father, we are deeply grateful for your many, many blessings to us. We thank you for the beauty of a place where we can meet. We thank you for the faithful proclamation of your word. Through the ministry of this church, we pray that our time together here would be filled with your grace and that your word would be richly dwelling in our hearts to the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, so Peter says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace to be given you searched intently and with the greatest care. So here he's alluding to all of the prophetic voices that we know of from the Old Testament. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, now a righteousness of God has been revealed which was witnessed by the law and the prophets. We as the new covenant community of faith nevertheless rest on a broad foundation of all of those books in the Old Testament, you know, so we should be students of the Old Testament. But when we read the Old Testament we realize, as somebody said once, that the Old Testament is a room richly furnished, but dimly lit. And so we kind of grope, you know what I mean? We sort of know that we're getting a hint and a taste and an anticipation of that New Testament reality. But if all we had to work with is the Old Testament, we'd probably be groping a whole lot and not quite clear about what sort of shape it would eventually take. And that's what Peter wants us to appreciate. They searched intently. They were trying to figure out, but it was as if they, the Old Testament prophets, even themselves, were seeing through a glass darkly. They didn't quite get the picture. It didn't come thundering home in human history until Christ. He comes on the scene, and all of a sudden, bam, it all kind of snaps into place. And we live in the great privilege of being to look, able to look back on that, whereas they, of course, had to look forward to it, and there was considerable obscurity in what they saw. One commentator, I like this, I never heard it put this way before, said the Old Testament is one great question, and the New Testament is one great answer. And in some ways, that is really the idea, isn't it? We read, I, I love the Old Testament, I read it probably more than the New Testament, actually, in my own personal uh, Bible reading, but I'm always aware as I'm reading it of how much it helps to keep the New Testament perspective in mind. And, I, you know, for all of us, I think that's good counsel. So Peter is reminding us of that. He's reminding, especially Jewish Christians now, 
of their Old Testament and how much it will inform their own understanding of Christ. Uh, Jesus says this interesting point on the same topic uh, to the disciples now, chapter 13 of Matthew, blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see (laughs) and to hear what you hear and they did not hear it. Uh, That really is the case. And so we are deeply grateful for our New Testament, which gives us this Light. One commentator said, those who knew only the prophetic hope were, in spite of their spirit-inspired insight, not as fortunate as are the simplest Christians who live in the Messianic era and know Christ's grace and presence. Somebody came to Jesus once from John the Baptist asking him questions, and as they went away, Jesus comments about John the Baptist Among those born of women, no one greater has come along than John the Baptist. Quite a compliment. Then he says, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. I don't think Jesus meant there greater in courage or personal, you know, none of that. It was meaning greater in privilege. John the Baptist himself died before he got the whole picture. His last question to Jesus was, are you the guy? You know, are we still waiting for someone? Even John didn't quite get the picture, even, and he went into his grave with that same kind of obscurity a little bit in his understanding that would only come ultimately through Christ himself. And so the privilege we have is not to be underestimated, and of course, Peter wants to remind us of that. He says that those prophets of old were inquiring about the person or time that the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So here's a little sort of, it's a a little bit beside the point, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, Several commentators pointed out, I think it it was a good point, I kind of missed it actually, but Peter makes specific reference to the Spirit of Christ working in those Old Testament prophets. The Spirit of Christ. And you think to yourself, you can't even really say that meaningfully unless you affirm somehow the deity of Christ. How can you speak of the Spirit of Christ working in these prophets if you aren't at the same time thundering, you know, the the implication that this is the Spirit of God? What else could it be? certainly not a created spirit. And that is one of those little hints that are just sprinkled all through the New Testament, that when we're dealing with Christ, we're dealing with deity. We're not dealing with just a great created human or something like that, as many people would like you to believe. There are plenty of cults running around that want to say Jesus was just a very exalted human. We say, no, that doesn't quite get it. Unless we have this triune God in our minds, we're missing substantially the reality of God. And so it's the Spirit of Christ. That's what Paul says as well. Romans chapter 8, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, you see, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you see, and and even he is using that kind of fluid sort of reference to the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, It's the Holy Spirit, at the same time, it's the triune God that we have before us. More to the point, in terms of this verse, this Spirit of Christ was pointing to the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. So two themes, pointing to the sufferings and the glory. And those two themes, on the face of it, seem like a contradiction in terms of the Old Testament understanding. That was part of the confusing aspect of the Old Testament message. Uh, Here we have on the one hand a suffering person, Isaiah 53, and other texts. And at the same time, we have a glorious character. And how do you put that together? See, in the Old Testament, it wasn't at all clear. And there was a fair amount of sort of uh, tension dissonance between those two themes, and that's what these people were trying to figure What in the world is this? Because I see suffering here, and I see glory there, and 
The Spirit of Christ was pointing in this direction, but they didn't quite figure it out. In the New Testament, we find again and again, there's a sense in which the mystery of a suffering, glorious Messiah is being presented to God's people in Christ with the idea that now we see the resolution of it. When Peter preached, Acts chapter 3, he said after the healing of the lame man there, you know, at the temple, Peter says, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, that was the non sequitur there, he has thus fulfilled. That was the unexpected twist in the whole story, that the Christ would suffer. Peter, or, uh, Paul stood up on, uh, on trial, you might say, before King Agrippa. This is toward the end of the book of Acts. And in his sermon, he's addressing something that was still kind of hanging in the air. What's the resolution of this? To this day, Paul says, I've had the help that comes from God, so I stand here testifying both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, namely, that the Spirit, I'm sorry, that Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim. Even there, there's that surprise element that Christ would suffer. The idea was repugnant to the Jewish people of the first century. Peter himself famously rebuked Jesus for saying that he was going to Jerusalem and suffer. Remember that? We talked about the Caesarea Philippi Confession. Peter gets this big benediction, blessed are you, Peter, wonderful, flesh and blood didn't show you that my father is in heaven. And then Jesus begins to explain it, I got to go to Jerusalem. I'm the Christ, the son of the living God has to go to Jerusalem and suffer. I have to be abused. I have to turn, be turned over to malicious forces in Jerusalem who are going to spit on me and, and uh, you know, abuse me and, and torture me and eventually crucify me. And all of those things are going to happen. Oh, by the way, I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. I think that was lost on Peter. All he heard was the suffering part. And he grabs Jesus by the collar and drags him off in a corner and says, now listen here, Jesus, that's not what's happening to you. Didn't you hear what I said? You're the Christ. The Christ doesn't suffer. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Far be it from you, Lord. You'll never suffer these things. You know, good Peter coming through doesn't have a clue, does he? We would have done the same thing because it was still just confusing. But at this point now, Peter is telling us, the same guy who was being rebuked by Jesus on that occasion, this is what that prophetic spirit was heading toward, what was pointing, and now we have some clarity about it. So this idea of suffering before glory, it was true for Jesus, it's true for us. And we, we, I, I think it's important to know that. You're all mature Christian believers. This is not news to you, but I think you understand that God's, God's purpose in life is that we humble ourselves and he exalts us. The humbling ourselves is the tough part, you know. I've got as much ego as anybody. I'm as capable of letting my pride take over my otherwise good judgment as anybody. And later on, of course, I tend to regret it because that's what we do when we let bad forces take over our better judgment. But if we have the presence of mind to appreciate, we let ourselves be humbled. We let ourselves not try to seize the high ground, but let the circumstances of life humble us. He will exalt. I read a book recently. I thought the title was just totally corny. But by the time I finished reading it, I decided it was pretty good. The title of the book is The J-Curve. The J, like the letter J, let's see. I would make it like this, so for you it's gonna be like that, right? Does that make a J? And the idea was in life, the J-Curve always goes down, and then it comes up to somewhere higher. The J-Curve. And he has a whole series of chapters illustrating the point in various ways. It was really quite good. And it's actually the 
I was put off by the title because it seemed a little silly, you know, but actually by the time I read it, I thought, that's not a bad book. I can't think of the author, sorry, but if you hunt down the J curve, uh, you'll come up with it. And his whole point was when we try to skip that little part that goes down and leap to the, this part, invariably, you know, if we humble ourselves, God exalts us, but God resists the proud. You know, it never works out well. So anyway, that's really the idea here. Suffering before glory was the way Jesus approached his life, and that, in fact, is the way we should approach our lives. Come right in. I'm so happy to see you. Come in. Look, they're coming in by the thousands. It's wonderful. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so anyway, when Jesus was walking along with the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, you recall, he made this comment. These are the two disciples totally disillusioned by the fact that Jesus, on whom they had pinned their hopes, had been crucified. They didn't know about the resurrection yet. This was resurrection morning, and it happened. And they're walking back to Emmaus, still dismayed at the horrible reversal of fortunes that has taken place in connection with the one in whom they had placed so much confidence. And Jesus asked them the question, road to Emmaus, wasn't it necessary that the Christ suffer before he enters his glory? So it's a good thing to keep in mind. Peter wants to remind us of it. And the final comment he wants to make here, it was revealed to them, the prophets of old, that they were serving not themselves, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel, the good news to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things even angels would like to look into. It was revealed to these prophets that though they were serving their own time to some significant measure, it wasn't ultimately for their benefit in their own time. You see. Every prophet in the Old Testament is addressing the issues of the day. I think you know that. You know, Joel's prophet, uh, the issues of the day. Isaiah certainly is talking about the issues of the day. Here's Assyria, there's Babylon. He's talking about forces that were at work at then. Most of you know I wrote a book a few years ago called The Historical Context of the Bible. The whole point of that book is to say it helps us to know what's going on in the world as we read the Old Testament. We can make sense out of a lot of the historical data there if we know what the, who the players are. You know, and so that's all it is, kind of a practical textbook, I hope. And, uh, and that's it. But as you read the Old Testament, you read Isaiah, you read Joel, you read Amos, you read these guys, you realize that just beneath the surface of everything they write is still this kind of strange sense that something better is coming. And many times it's not spelled out very clearly. There's not a whole lot of definitive information, but you just get the feeling. They're addressing issues of the day, but they still have this kind of sort of shimmering hope, looking forward to something better that's out there but the contours of it are just a little bit obscure. But they understood it. It was revealed to them that they were not ultimately serving themselves, but you, with respect to the things that have now been announced to you in the gospel, sent by the Holy, you know, by people preaching in the power of the Spirit, even angels would like to get in on this one, you know. Um, the Old Testament, generally speaking, has that kind of forward-looking idea to it. It's been interesting to, um, if you consider Old Testament civilizations, virtually all of them would look back on a golden age. The Egyptians looked back on the building of the pyramids, you know, and they were built you know, many, many years before many of the events we're familiar with in Egyptian history and so on. Many of the civilizations had this kind of looking back wistfully on a golden age. Israel was the only exception. They always looked forward to a golden age. They kind of had this, this expectation of something better out there. Uh, sometimes it was made rather clear in Daniel. Daniel was told, seal up the vision because it's referring to something in the distant future, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, same idea. Uh, 
It's a good principle for us as Christians to know that the New Testament is intended to explain the Old Testament. Um, I have read people and heard them speak occasionally over the years who want to make the case, for example, that there are texts in the book of Ezekiel or Daniel or other prophetic texts that are actually describing geopolitical events in the 21st century. That you can read parts of Ezekiel and it will explain the Ukraine war. You think, you know, that is not only misguided, it is positively destructive of a proper view of the scripture. It is, it is such a distraction that it virtually pre present, uh, prevents understanding what the text is actually saying. Now, I know you're way, uh, this is not a problem for you, you know, you're good, sophisticated Bible students, but that, that mentality is still there. And the, the New Testament basically is saying to us, Christ says more than once, that the entire corpus of the New Testament prophetic ministry was culminated in John. All the prophets, Jesuses of the Old Testament were until John who gives us Jesus. And all of it is play Roma, is filled to the full in Christ. And so the hints in the Old Testament we see from that point on are the great effects of Christ. But to start looking for political or, or other kinds of details of subsequent history is not only useless, but I think you know, positively hurtful to our understanding of the scriptures. So anyway, for what it's worth, enough of that uh, soapbox. Paul says that in the church and in the significance of the church, uh, we are to understand the great mystery of what God has been hiding all through the years, but now is made known. Now through the church is the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in this heavenly place. The church has a strategic role to play in the world. Sometimes we don't, we don't realize that. Uh, we have kind of a maybe a less than appreciative understanding or estimate of its importance. But the church around the world continues to have huge influence. Sometimes we don't know about it. Um, I saw a video not too long ago, well attested by the church in Iran, you know. There is a strong church in Iran. It's underground, it's illegal, but it's alive and well, and it's having a significant impact there. Now, we don't hear about that in the daily news, do we? I haven't heard anybody talk about that, no matter what their political disposition. But the fact of the matter is, you know, these are, these are important things. One out of five people who calls himself a Christian today lives in Africa. One out of five, 20% of the self-described people in the world who call themselves Christians live in Africa. It isn't necessarily a pleasant place to live for a Christian, you know. It can be risky. There's a whole story of what the church is doing in the world, in China, in other places. We just don't hear about it in the press, but we need to, through the eyes of faith, believe it, because, in fact, it's exactly what the scriptures say would take place. God is showing his manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities, not only of this world, but of the unseen world, through his church that he redeemed with his own blood. So let's not apologize for the church. It's got its bumps and bruises, but nevertheless, it is what God using, God's using for this purpose. All right, that's the rest of last week's lecture, okay? Now it's this week, and this is where Peter again shifts gears and says, okay, we have this wonderful description. The new birth has happened to us the effects of it, an eternal inheritance, faith that gives us eyes to see. This it is the realization of all the Old Testament, all of that now, Peter's got it in the books, but now what do I do? What's the call? And, and Peter gives it to us in fundamentally what we're gonna call the call to holiness, that's the term. Uh, therefore, prepare your minds for action, be sober-minded, or we might render it self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, there's a ton of things happening in this verse. High theology now being tied to practical sort of utility. Okay, what do I do? And there's three things here in this verse to highlight. One, prepare your mind for 
action, athletic competition. The old expression of the King James was, gird up the loins. You know that expression? Of course, you know where it comes from. These guys wore their flowing robes. It's fine. It makes you look very dignified. But if you're going into a contest, it's a bit of a nuisance to have these flowing robes around. So they had little bands that they would put around, and of course, then they could move more freely and, and with greater agility. And so that was a standard phrase, gird up. Well, here he's saying, gird up the loins, or prepare, it's really prepare your mind for action. The force of the phrase is, I'm going to go into a contest of some kind. It might be a contest on the order of a fight. I might be in there, engaged in some kind of contest, which is going to engage my uh, abilities and so on at the point of, of an actual physical altercation. I mean, it would be used in that context. Uh, con context. Uh, it could be an athletic competition, a race, wrestling, or any, but anything that's going to engage me. And the focus of it is what's going on out there. So I'm going to be heading into something that's going to test me test me in some kind of, you might say, athletic way, only here it's a mental thing, gird up the loins or prepare your mind for action. That's the idea. So um, it's a, it, it was an instruction to these people living at that time, but it's certainly good counsel for us. They were living at a particular moment where they needed to prepare for action because they had a few years of bumpy roads ahead of them, and Peter's trying to give them fair warning to get ready, buckle up, you know, that's what's happening. But of course, all of us live in a similar kind of situation. It varies from time to time, but, but there's a general principle here that we can all embrace. Some of you know the name Dorothy Sayers. Dorothy Sayers uh, is generally credited. A wonderful little essay she wrote was actually the inspiration behind what's called the classical school movement. I used to teach at a classical school, you know, here. Uh, there's many of them. In this area, there's many of them. There's hundreds of them across the country. It's kind of grown up in the last 50 years, classical schools. Uh, and she wrote a wonderful little essay, Once Upon a Time, that was kind of the inspiration for that whole thing. It's a wonderful little thing, only two or three pages long. But in her day, she was a biting critic. She was a Christian, but a really biting critic of what we would call evangelical Christianity in her day, and she, was, she pulled no punches, you know. Now this is a typical quote. It's being quoted by a different commentator, but I thought the quote was so good. This applies to nobody in this room, all right? I just wanna make that clear. So all of you are exempted from this, but I thought you might appreciate it. This is, this, she says, the seven most conspicuous virtues of ordinary church members are, and she meant largely evangelical Christian people in America. That's the audience she had in mind. Are, number one, respectability, childishness, mental timidity, dullness, sentimentality, censoriousness, and repression of spirits. Whew. Yeah. What she um, lacks in gentility, she makes up for in clarity, you know, kind of thing. So, so uh, no, I, I, like I said, you're all exempt from this, but it, well, and I, I think it's also helpful to know she wrote this in the 1940s. I don't know what she'd say about the church. I don't think we've improved a lot. I'm afraid that from her estimate, at least, you know, maybe things have not uh, moved in a very good direction, but that was her, her assessment. Now, the commentator who quotes her in that regard Based on, uh, based on what we hear in this verse, continues by saying, Peter has a very different perspective. We should especially <clears throat> be about seeing the meaning of our faith in the light of the culture of the moment. What she's criticizing is sort of, what do you call it, kind of evangelical monastery, where people who, because of their Christian faith, more or less detach themselves from the public square and live rather private, insulated, isolated lives of lovely Christian fellowship, but largely ignore what's going on out there. You know, and, and we're all familiar with that. This commentator is saying that Christians should be just the opposite. We should be very much aware, plugged in, up to speed, uh, taking seriously the news of the day, the story of what's happening. We should be well informed. That's the idea. 
we should be seeing the meaning of our faith in the light of the culture of the moment. A real church refuses the superficial demand of sentimental people for sermons that entertain but do not instruct. I've heard a few of those in my life. None here, but elsewhere. <laughs> sermons that have a great entertainment value might be somewhat inspiring, but really don't say much. There are those kinds of sermons out there every day of the week. Uh, <clears throat> instruct for an easy Christianity that makes no demands upon the mind. And this is an emphasis on the mind. Prepare your mind for action. So we should be students. We should be not only studying the Bible, that's certainly a given, but also aware, you know, reading up on what's happening and, and well-informed. That's part of what this is all about because it helps us prepare our minds for action. The focus is what's going on out there. And I can't really prepare for what's going on out there unless I'm informed about what's going on out there. So that's the first one. Second one, see present threats with sobriety. Peter says, be sober-minded. The focus of this one is more inward. So I'm looking at a contest, and that's one piece of information I need to have. The second piece is I need to look at myself and ask myself, how equipped am I for this contest? What are my strengths? What are my vulnerabilities? What's the role I have? What gifts are at my disposal to meet the challenge that's out there? So it's an out there and in here kind of assessment. So sober-minded means I have a legitimate assessment of myself. Paul says in Romans 13 that a person should not consider themselves better than they ought, but they should be sober. I shouldn't have an egotistical view seeing myself as better than I am, nor should I have a sort of uh, <clears throat> unnecessarily self-deprecating view that doesn't appreciate what I am. There's a soberness that really knows what I am, who I am, what my gifts are, what I can bring to the contest, you see. And so that's the two, the two sides of this. And both of them are, are involved in a, in a call to get ready to move, get ready to do something, get ready for action. The third one, oh, by the way, the, the quote here from commentator, tuck in the belt for action, he says. So that's really a paraphrase. It's like roll up your sleeves, brace yourselves, and then be sober. Keep calm, don't panic, don't freak out, you know, all of that stuff. Be aware of the challenges, but at the same time, be aware of what you can bring to that challenge by the grace of God. Set your hope fully on God's grace, hope in grace, not in politics. We're in an election cycle. You know, we have our political views and so on. There's always a tendency to think, well, if just that person is elected, then everything's going to be fine. Well, don't you believe it? No matter who's elected, we got problems, you know, so let's just, you know, face up to that. But one thing is true, our hope in Christ is a well-founded hope. And so that's the idea, that my sober-mindedness should be rooted in that true foundation. Then finally, uh, the third one, <clears throat> keep the prospect of Christ's appearance in mind. This is the one where I think we easily get confused. Peter says, put your hope firmly in the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. So it's easy to think when we hear the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ, that we're speaking of the second coming. There is a second coming. Human history is, in fact, going somewhere. There is a consummation out there. That's part of our orthodox, you know, affirmation. So... Christ sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty, from which he will come to judge the quick and the dead. So there we But not every reference in the scriptures to a revelation of Christ, or even of the coming of Christ, is a reference to the second coming. That's where we need to be more careful. One of the most well-known phrases in the first century was, the Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven. That was a well-known phrase. It was a quote from Daniel, and everybody had heard it. And there was a bit of a question in the air. When is that going to happen? The coming of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven. When is that going to happen? And Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, then you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Knowingly quoting that text, as if to say, I know you've been wondering about it, 
This is when you're going to see it. And Jesus says then almost in the you know, next few verses, truly I tell you, this generation won't pass from the scene until all these things have taken place, in, including the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven. Manifestly not the second coming, but rather in some sense part of the broader complex of the first coming in which Jesus came in judgment, set aside the old covenant, established his kingdom, which is precisely what Daniel was referring to. Then will be given to him a kingdom. It's not the end of the kingdom, it's the beginning of the kingdom of Christ. All right. The revelation of Jesus Christ that Peter has in mind here is very likely, almost virtually certainly, tied to that kind of expectation. Peter is writing to people about the year 65, it's still part of that generation that Jesus said, this generation will not pass until all these things happen. They're about five years out from the end of that generation. It's a time when Nero is going to become a pretty much unhinged. He's going to be launching powerful imperial forces against Christians. So brace yourselves, Peter warns them, you know. This is going to be a bumpy ride. You're going to be tested. There's going to be a fiery trial. He refers to that. This whole book is anticipating that. But also, he's ensuring them in a sense that the end is in sight. This is not going to last forever. There is a kind of, um, uh, you've got to see it through to the conclusion. And, and so whether the storm, but the revelation of Christ is actually going to be a time in which you can, you can have some hope of these things being over, at least for a while. All right. So here we are in 65. Well, the whole thing was over by 70 AD. In fact, the persecution of Christians was over by 68. It was about a three-year window. And then Rome turned her guns on Israel, and it wound up destroying Israel, and Christians more or less were lost in the shuffle there for a while. We as Christian people all through history are living at times when we might see that there's going to be a bumpy road. We can't put ourselves in exactly the same situation historically as they were in, but the principle applies. We may see we're in a situation where it appears that there's going to be some tough moments, but we can always look forward to the revelation of Christ. Not the, in, not the second coming necessarily, but simply Christ finally saying, okay, enough. It's an interesting thing to look at history and see how almost without exception, bad people come to a bad end. You ever notice that? You know, bad people tend virtually always to come to a bad end. People who stand for virtuous things tend to be remembered well. Think of the Second World War. You think of Winston Churchill. You think of Adolf Hitler. You know, one of those guys was not perfect at all. Winston Churchill had a lot of faults. You just read a few biographies, you'll figure that. But he stood for what the right things were. We remember him today as one of the greatest heroes of the 20th century, right? Winston Churchill. It's just like he's, he kind of stands for, for great courage in the face of Hitler. I don't even have to tell you, you know, how he's remembered. This is, this is not just one time. This has happened over and over. Why? Because Jesus is king. The kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, but he who sits in heaven scoffs. Jesus says, not so fast. I'll give you a little time. I'll give you a little rope. But ultimately, I'm running the shop. And I'm not going to let evil just run rampant forever. And that's what Peter has in mind here. He says, set your hope not only on a hope in eternity, which is certainly important enough, but a hope that Christ is still king now, and that even in the midst of tumultuous, troubled times, I can trust that he is still in charge, that he is still the king and lord and sovereign over the details of my circumstances. And so my hope is not ultimately in politics or which political party, but my hope is ultimately in Christ, who is the one who is, in fact, sovereign over all these events. So for these people, in five years, it was going to be a different world, even a little before that. He continues, as obedient children, 
don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Literally, it reads as children of obedience. It's an idiomatic way of putting it. In the ancient world, we don't usually speak that way, but to be a child of something, generally in the scriptures, meant to be one that carried the character of that thing. You know, when Jesus said to John and James, you guys are sons of thunder. You know that? What do you mean? He didn't mean they were born in a thunderstorm, did he? He didn't mean, you know, he, he meant their character was so bombastic. They wanted to call fire down on some Samaritans. Jesus said, no, I don't think we'll do that today. You know, probably in Jesus' power to do it, but no, you guys, you're, you're, you know, you're a little bit too much like a thunderstorm here. I think there may be a different approach we want to take. Uh, Jesus said to the Pharisees on one occasion, you guys are sons of the devil. They were liars, and the devil has been lying from the beginning. And thus they were carrying out the quality of that. Well, here we're to be sons of obedience. That's the phrase, children of obedience. The New Testament emphasis on obedience refers to the idea of freedom. Uh, to obey God is the biblical definition of freedom. We sometimes think, well, freedom is just my ability to do what I want. It's true, but if I love the Lord Jesus Christ, what I want is to obey him. You know, that's what I want, and freedom is that which gives me the power to do what I want. And in fact, slavery is when I'm unable to do what I really want. It's true in human relationships. It's certainly true in our relationship to Christ. Paul, I think, puts the most clarity into that in Romans chapter 6. When you were slaves of sin, which we all were, we came into this world slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Wasn't that a great life? Slave to sin, do what you want, feed your addictions. How many tragic, pathetic people do we see who are enslaved to self-destructive forces and they can't stop. It's an awful, horrible thing. We see it. Our hearts break for people that are just enslaved. Paul says himself, what benefit, what fruit, what good outcome did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? When my darker forces in my own heart get the better of me and I say something or do something that doesn't represent the spirit of God in me, but more what the Bible calls the spirit of the flesh in me, invariably later, I'm embarrassed about it. <laughs> you know, you have that experience? It's just hard to be proud of the person you are at your worst. You know. But the person we want to be the person who is the best version of ourselves is somebody in whom we can take great, great, I want to use the word very cautiously, pride, because we're happy that we did what we ought to do. And invariably, that's going to be some form of obedience to Christ. It's just one of those ironies of life, I suppose. So Paul says the end of those things was self-destructive. But now, having been freed from sin, we became slaves, to be sure, of God. The result? The fruit to holiness, which Peter refers to here, the end is everlasting life. So, one commentator said, obedience is a joyful expression of love for the one obeyed. A joyful expression of love for the one obeyed. You know, I love my wife. Sometimes she asks me to do something. And the fact of the matter is, I like to do it. Why? Because I love her, and I want her to be pleased. Now, don't tell her that. That's our little secret here. <laughs> this is just my... But the fact of the matter is, it's not the least bit burdensome to do what she'd like me, because I want to please. And you know you have loving relations. We all can identify. Well, to love Jesus is to want to please. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, Jesus says. And that's freedom. Freedom. 
You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. There's a freedom in being obedient. There's a freedom in being a slave, as it were, to righteousness. Obedience is the joyful expression of love for the one obeyed. It is freedom to do as we ought, and it's what we truly want. It's freedom from the ravaging addictions to self-destructive behavior that only creates pathetic slavery. So, don't conform. This word is suschematizo. Huh? Not a great word. The root of the word is schema, suschema. Tidzo, it's the scheme. And he says, don't be pressed into the scheme of this world. There is a scheme in this world, and there's a scheme that comes from Christ, and they are not, they're not very similar. Uh, Paul has the same thing in mind in Romans 12. I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, you present yourself as a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the scheme of this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Uh, the warning here is suggesting a reflecting of the image of God uh, is what we should be doing rather than the, as it were, lusts of this world. So what's the bottom line here? He says, as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. You know that the foundational description of God in the Bible is that he is holy. He's holy holy, holy. The trace hagion is the term that's used technically to describe the repetition of the three times holy. And in Hebrew literary um, uh, sort of structure, it was a way of saying this is the most important level of emphasis I could put on something. So whatever we know about God, he's loving, he's just, he's righteous, he's this, he's that. All the things we know about God are conditioned deeply by the fact that he's holy. His love is holy love. His righteousness is holy righteousness, so on, you know. God is holy, and so we're called to be holy in the sense that God is holy. Now, people have interesting responses to the idea we should be living a holy life, and I found a great quote. I'm wrapping up with this, uh, and I'm going to give it to you one line at a time because every line of it is helpful. But he says, holy has picked up unfortunate connotations, as in, quote, holy Joe, right? You all know that. I don't want to meet somebody who's a holy Joe. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean by that? Stuffy, rigid, unapproachable, puffed up, demanding, censorious, you know, all of the things that we don't find very attractive. And there are people like that in the world people who are so wrapped up in their own holiness that they just, you know, it's like they're not a normal human and, and how can you even relate to that? And this commentator appreciates that is what sometimes comes to our mind when we hear the expression, you shall be holy. Well, I don't want to be that. Good heavens, you know, that was awful. You know? and, and so we have a recoiling effect to the phrase, well, that's not what the Bible means. So I think we should take some comfort in that. Uh, and he continues here, God is absolutely holy. That's what we were saying earlier. He is holy, holy, holy. Kadesh, the Hebrew word for holy, means, it's, the root is to divide. It means God is different. He's other than. He's separate from us. Different from all else. We are to be separate as well, different from all else. So in other words, if God is utterly different from us, he is deity, we're humanity. He's not just an elevated human. He is something of a whole different kind of being. Then God commands us to be holy in part to, to reflect the otherness of God. That's why we're called to be different. It's to remind people that God is even more different than any of us. In the Old Testament, thus, the holiness code was intended to make the people of Israel different in some conspicuous way from everybody else. So Israel was called to be holy. We're now called to be holy in a deeper sense. You read the holiness code in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, Exodus, uh, to some degree Numbers, Deuteronomy. You read that Mosaic code, the holiness code. It was the word of God. It was for those people. But just between you and me, we might be a little put off by it, you know? The rules went down to things like how you can trim your beard, how you can cut your hair, 
the kind of food you can eat, whether the, the hooves are you know, separated or not, whether it choose the, I mean, all kinds of, we would say somewhat pedantic distinction. I'm being, I'm trying to be reverent here, but the fact of the matter is that when you read the holiness code of the Old Testament, most people are pretty glad we don't live by those rules anymore. Why did God do that? Why was he imposing all of these meticulous rules on that people? Answer, he wanted them to be conspicuously different. He wanted everybody in the ancient world to look at that nation and say, wow, those people are different. You know, they may not have been impressed with the sense they were, but they certainly granted they were different. And in some ways, they were good rules. You know, um, a lot of the diseases that affected other nations didn't affect Israel for that very reason. There were some hygienic reasons, other things. But nevertheless, the fundamental idea was they were to be different. I heard one commentator say kind of tongue-in-cheek, if you just read them and didn't know anything else about them, you might think they looked like more like a bunch of cultic taboos than the Word of God, you know, and, and there may be some truth to it. Well, we can be happy that all of those rules that came from the pen of Moses ended, ended, the old covenant system ended permanently, fini, it's over. There was a final definitive judgment of all of that, and it was set aside. We are not under the code of Moses, period. We are under the code of Christ. And in some ways, the holiness call in our lives goes vastly deeper. It's not simply how I trim my beard anymore. There's no rule in the New Testament, thou shalt trim thy beard this way. There's nothing like that, you see. The rules that apply to us go much deeper. In some ways, they're far more exacting because they reach down to the very core of who we are, which is what he's getting at here. If the church had true holiness, this commentator concludes, it would know spiritual power, conquer atheism, agnosticism, produce great leaders, move toward church union, and have ebullient joy. We haven't talked yet about what is it. All I've told you now is what it isn't, okay? So the rest of the book of Peter, is in a sense going to unpackage for us Peter's holiness code. But it is something very different from the holiness code that might be in our minds, a caricature of holiness, or even the holiness code that we might find in the Old Testament. But it's rather a description of what it means to be a genuine Christian living in the kingdom. It's very much an echo of the Sermon on the Mount, it's certainly the ethic we find in the New Testament, but Peter wants to spell it out for us now in, uh, in you know, terms of the community that he's addressing at that point in time. So the holiness code of Christ is an echo of what we read in Leviticus, you shall be holy for I am holy, but it rather is, uh, is as the New Testament interprets that term, and that's what we'll be looking at. Whew. Thank you for hanging on. I got a late start, so that's my excuse for going late. But uh, anyway, I appreciate your patience. Quick Sunday school lesson as we uh, wrap this up. Number one, Christians are people of faith who live in the quiet confidence of things that are true, even if not visible. So we Christians, we follow the news, we pay attention to what's going on, we vote, we are responsible, members of the, uh, of the civic community, we, you know, all of that stuff is part of what we do. The difference between a Christian and anybody else is that while we do all of that stuff and we're up to speed on it and we ought to be, the eyes of faith give us a little broader vision. So we see that whatever's happening and however distressed people may be in terms of what's happening in a given moment, we know that there's a broader context in which to interpret these events. That in fact, Jesus hasn't gone out of business. He hasn't resigned his commission. He hasn't gone on vacation. He's not absent, AWOL, from the job of running the universe. And so even if bad people do tend to appear to get some kind of traction or momentum in this world, we know that Jesus is not sleeping. And the eyes of faith tell us that. Because the eyes of faith show us the kingdom. Jesus says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. 
But with the eyes of faith, we see there's a broader context to today's news. And so let's not lose track of that as we pay attention to what's happening. Number two, Christians are people of hope who know that regardless of the choppy seas we face, Christ is the sovereign over every detail of every headline. So we are the people who know that Christ will sometimes finally say, enough. He might give people the ability to get away with some stuff for a while, but eventually it tends to be the case that people who are doing nefarious things get found out. And then we're glad we're not one of them, you know. For a time, it seems like the, 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 the bad actors are getting all the benefits. The psalmist whines about that again and again. How come evil people prosper? You know, he's giving that great complaint. But ultimately, it tends to be the case that bad actors come to bad ends. And so we should live in hope. We should live in hope, not simply of the second coming, but of what God may be doing even now in terms of the events of life. And finally, Christians are people of love who meet the occasional rancor and hostility of culture with the merciful spirit of Christ who can cause lions to lie down with lambs. We fight the battles in this world with the weapon of love. Paul says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good is a weapon. Love is a weapon. And so we go into the circumstances, the battles with the weapon of love and believe that God will infuse that with his power to accomplish his purposes. And I'm finished droning on, but I'd love to hear from you. All the most brilliant people in this church are sitting right here. It's such an honor to have you here. I just really appreciate it. So, um, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a I had somebody send me an email. I think it was after it was either it was this past week or maybe the week before. Asking that, it said, "Wait a minute! I thought Peter was a fisherman, you know? And wh how, where did all of this just? I mean, it, it's very well, not only well reasoned but well written, you know." like the guy somehow threw in a PhD somewhere along the line, you know, to kind of up his... But I think it's helpful. These are all certainly Peter's thoughts, so not taking anything from that. But Peter does say at the end that he wrote this letter with the help of Silvanus, otherwise known to us as Silas, who was a very well-educated guy, you know. Uh, he was the traveling companion of Paul, you know, for a certain time. We don't know a lot about him, but we know enough to know that he was kind of a top drawer academic of his day. And so I think that's part of how Peter comes across maybe a little more articulate <laughs> than he would have on his own. He was a bright guy, no question about that, but I think he probably had a little literary help and theological. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty well, tightly well reasoned. And he had the Holy Spirit, that always helps, you know, absolutely, so that's right. So this is, a, the, 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 we always want to keep that in mind. These are, these are inspired words. But the church has always been very cautious to say to be inspired by the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as saying the Holy Spirit is dictating. It's not word-for-word -word dictation, but it is certainly uh, infusing the wisdom of God into things that are being said. Yeah, yeah. I think, okay, great question, and it's a deep question. And so I'm going to proceed cautiously, okay? Because I, whenever we start attacking the question of what is the Trinity, we need to be cautious. What we have in the New Testament are analogies, metaphors. We know there's some truth. In fact, the church historically has sort of viewed the Trinity as a mystery, and what we do is draw bounds around it. And if we cross over those binds, we, we get into heresy, we know that orthodoxy is somewhere in the middle, but we never presume to think we, all, we figured it out. You know. So, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, um, um, what did he, it was, uh, 
you know, if, if you, I can't reconstruct it anyway, he makes reference to the Spirit of God, and then in the next breath, the Spirit of Christ. Okay. And he manifestly means the same thing. The Spirit, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he says, he doesn't belong to Christ. And immediately before that, like four or five words earlier, he spoke of the Spirit of God. So, uh, it's virtually universally taken to be the case that Paul though he says the Spirit of God first, and then he says the Spirit of Christ, he means the same Spirit. And we would infer from that that the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ is in fact the Spirit of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Um, Jesus says in John chapter 14, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you, and yet he says it in the immediate context of sending the parakletos, the Holy Spirit. As if to say, as I come to you in the Holy Spirit, I'm really coming to you. I'm not off doing something else and just sending him off. You know, I, the presence of the Holy Spirit is in some ways my presence with you. Well, how do we put that together? I had a conversation with a Ph.D. friend of mine who teaches biblical studies and does not believe in the Trinity. And, um, and I was saying, you know, I, we, we have these frank conversations a few years ago, maybe four or five years ago. I said, you know, isn't it odd? You, you raise the issue of the Trinity as my supreme vulnerability because I'm, I'm, I'm embracing a doctrine that you say is patently absurd, this doctrine of the Trinity, you know. And I think, I say, you know, isn't it interesting that the church has been clinging to something which is one of the most complex, difficult, challenging ideas about God you could possibly imagine. You would think if the church had just invented a doctrine of God, they could have done better than that. If the church was just inventing a theology out of whole cloth, don't you think it would have been a simpler theology? But to come up with this incredibly profound idea that God is one God and yet in three persons, and each has a distinct identity, and yet there's a perfect coincidence of consciousness and intention. Who would invent that? What looney tune would invent such a thing unless it's in fact what the Bible actually teaches and we're stuck with it, and therefore we have to construct a theology to accommodate what the Bible seems to be saying. Paul says the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. Elsewhere we have, you haven't lied to God, you've lied, yeah, and then he says, to the Holy Spirit. And, and obviously to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. All of these kind of odd things in the Bible. And so you say, you know, he's blaming me for embracing a patent absurdity. And I'm saying, well, I feel like I'm stuck with what the Bible teaches. And if the Bible teaches this, I'm not so sure it's absurd. It may be mysterious. No, yeah. I wouldn't say that, okay? Um, I, I think the, clearly the Old Testament contemplates what's called the Ruach Yahweh, the Spirit of the Lord, coming on people. And as a result of that, they were able to do the supernatural things they did. So the prophets had the Spirit of Yahweh. The, the, the whole idea, even Isaiah, when he's commissioned as a prophet, is being anointed with God's Spirit. You see, you find that. Various people, not everybody by any means. In fact, Moses, Numbers chapter 11, laments that all God's people aren't getting God's Spirit, only the 70 here. But they are getting God's Spirit. So I think the answer is not that the Holy Spirit wasn't there, but simply that in the Old Testament economy, it wasn't God's purpose that there be complete clarity. It was just an intentional purpose on God's part to keep things a little bit obscure. Paul says in, in Galatians that law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Well, a schoolmaster doesn't necessarily give you everything, just kind of leads you along in a discipline of learning until finally, you know, in, in this case, Christ comes, who, un, who sort of unlocks all the understanding. So I guess I'd say it's more just a, a design 
of just keeping things somewhat obscure, richly furnished, dimly lit, until the light of the world shows up and then we get it. I, that's the way I, I view that. Those are great questions. Karen always asks the tough questions here, you know, but, but uh, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Boy, I, I really appreciate your being here. You know, I hope you know that. I just thank you for it. Thanks for sticking around. And, um, and uh, so uh, I appreciate it. So anyway, um, anything else? Any other? Keep you past lunchtime? No? Okay. Let's pray. Father, we are deeply grateful. Thank you for each of these individuals, for their faith in you, for their uh, devotion to, to serve you, to be a part of this church, and to involve the things that go on here. We're grateful for that. Thank you for this time we've had to review this text of Scripture. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that inspired Peter to write these words, that you preserve them down through history, that they could come to us now 2,000 years later, and we can read them and benefit from them. We're so grateful. I ask you to go, for, go with us now in our various ways that all that we do this afternoon would honor you asking this in Jesus' name.